Uh, I'd like to uh, now invite uh, Dr. Shukert, Manfred Shukert, uh, to, to, to the stage. Uh, Manfred's another uh, important voice in the industry uh, representing Daimler, and he's going to give us uh, a view of the challenge of worldwide CO2 regulation. So looking at, at Daimler's global view of uh, how the regulation of, of CO2 is developing um, and how this affects technology, uh, looking at also his view of the CO2 regulation coming up in Europe. Um, Dr. Shukert is responsible for environment and safety um, at Daimler. He's, been, had this, he's had this role for some years and he's involved in the, the negotiations um, to do with those topics. He's also responsible for the coordination of urea infrastructure supporting uh, the technologies. Um, and he's got a background in uh, automotive propulsion systems. So a very wide perspective too. And we're always very glad to have Manfred back. So um, we look forward to the updates and see where things have moved from Daimler's point of view. Over to you. Thanks, Tim. Uh, yeah, and also from my side, a very warm welcome here to this wonderful city. I'm, look, I'm very happy that so many foreign people found a way to, to the eastern part of, the, uh, of Germany. And uh, let's try to a little bit uh, provide you with an overview on, on uh, let me say, worldwide regulations for heavy-duty vehicles, but of course also then finally uh, focusing on the European activity trying not to double what Rolf just said and uh, providing a little bit more uh, from other perspectives. Um, yeah, starting, um, and, and it's a bit similar to what Rolf already said, but uh, providing maybe a bit a broader overview. If you think on, on the current anthropogenic emissions uh, right now, and you see it on the very left bar, uh, 2015 at least, the official statement is around about 36 billion tons of CO2 has been, have been emitted by the societies um, uh, of, of this uh, globe. Um, and if you take everything together, roughly about 18% are allocated uh, to transport activities, which is about 6.7 billion tons of CO2. Uh, and if you take that together, then you will see that um, roughly about 28% are coming from the heavy duty side. And then you go back and, and, and downwards to uh, on the right side, uh, and you see the most important single contributor are the United States, uh, followed by the European uh, Union, and then followed by China, but uh, we believe at least, um, uh, at least our own model uh, tells us that soon China will overtake uh, the European activity and becomes the most, let me say, the second uh, most important contributor. And if the growth rate continues in China, then we will soon see that China will become the most important uh, emitter, CO2 emitter uh, on the heavy duty side as well. Um, so that provides you a little bit of an, an overview, uh, gives you a glimpse of um, what, uh, what is the share of the heavy duty industry. If you take everything together, that's about 5% that uh, heavy duties are contributing to, to the, uh, to the anthropogenic uh, CO2 emissions. Um, this is a very busy chart and I can't go in every, in, in every detail. But of course, uh, first of all, what you should take with you is that we have many activities right now, very parallel, um, and every market as it is always be, every, every government wants to develop its own process, its own regulation, and unfortunately, we can't see a real global activity in that field. It's really a shame, I have to say, from a an, from an, uh, company's perspective, but I also think this is a waste of money and, and, um, and scientific activity uh, because it's simply not necessary. But going from the top to the down, you see, and I don't focus too much on the criteria pollutant emissions, uh, looking a little bit more on the, on the greenhouse gas or fuel economy or CO2 activities, um, and, and you see, of course, what has been mentioned um, somewhere by 2018 in the mid uh, in, in the official uh, activities, it's, it's pushed forward, but we will see uh, finally where it comes out. But uh, somewhere in 2018, the Commission 
um, has announced to, pro uh, to provide you with a proposal on heavy duty standards. Um, for some restricted classes so far, but we expect that uh, in the following time we will see uh, an, an additional activity in the not yet regulated classes. Um, it has been mentioned already, the greenhouse gas phase two program um, uh, in the United States is, is certainly the most important uh, regulation right now, uh, most difficult one with some thousands of pages. Um, if you take everything together, we expect soon a standard on the Japanese side, the standard, second standard, the FES 2025. So we, they have already one, and, uh, but it, um, it is clear uh, that they put another one on the table. We have in China already a stage three uh, to be fulfilled by around 2020 with lots of uh, caveats and lots of uh, details we have to follow with. Um, and they are even talking about a, a stage four activity soon uh, coming out um, at least. We see some activities in India and also since uh, some weeks already in, uh, also in Brazil. Um, it's all coming up. And then there are other markets which now are um, um, let me say, coming into this place, and, and George has just mentioned also uh, Korea, for example. Again, Korea is on the, on the, uh, on the table uh, with an own approach uh, and uh, with an own simulation tool. So if you look uh, on a global perspective, uh, we have to, although we deliver similar vehicles or sometimes even identical vehicles to the various markets, we have to comply with different regulations. Um, <clears throat> this slide is a bit more in detail, um, just for an overview again, uh, the four most important markets. Uh, and if you go to the right side, uh, the detailed steps, I think the very crucial point is in the middle for us. Uh, first of all, we do not always talk about the same gross vehicle weights or gross combination weights. They are always uh, in a different level. So the Americans are talking about 80,000 pounds, which is about 36 tons. So their limits are in a different level and uh, it's always difficult then to compare uh, the regulations between or the, 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 the standards between the various regulations and I'll come to that in a, in a minute. Um, the second uh, important thing certainly are the, the test methods behind and I think this is a crucial point as well um, and, and this slide may give you a little bit more of a detail in that respect. Uh, the one, ones are using more uh, the, the ancient powertrain testings, and by, by the way, uh, one thing what has been mentioned earlier on the, Euro, uh, on the US phase two program, they continue to have a, a separated uh, ancient standard, uh, which is by far not really the most cost efficient uh, um, approach. Um, but they decided to do it for a certain important topic. Uh, the second thing, of course, is if you now compare the various uh, basics uh, or the, the methodologies uh, on which then finally the standard has been um, developed and has been uh, finalized, um, it's certainly that you have then different, different methodologies. Um, give you one example. In, in Europe, we decided to go for a constant speed measurement of the aerodynamic drag. In the US, it's a, it's a coast down procedure. A coast down of a 36 uh, ton vehicle that requires uh, them to, to go to one exactly place in the United States to measure it. Um, and uh, this is certainly, I think, really not the most efficient one. When a manufacturer who is uh, in, in, the, in the western part of the U.S. has to drive uh, three or four thousand miles to go to the, to the spot where they can measure the aerodynamic drag, which is, which is in Florida. So I think uh, this is not really a, a, a thing which we, we have to do or which, which we should do. And so uh, there are, there are criticals uh, in between and if you go into details, you should really be cautious to compare the various standards because it, it's, there is really the risk that you have then apples and uh, other things compared. Yeah, in that respect, 
let me say, I don't, and I, I keep this um, a headline because it's a little bit provocative, as we know already that the Commission decided to go for a standard for the European market. Um, but literally have a look a little bit behind. I think this is something what we have really to be to keep in mind in order to to judge what is coming coming up in in the near future. First of all, um, are we really in a situation that we have a significant growth uh, of CO2 in the European market? Um, of course, we are here in Germany, and Germany is uh, is proud of uh, its um, uh, economic development, and uh, we, we we really like it. And this economic development certainly leads also to major transport activities on the road. And if you travel through Germany, you see lots of trucks running on the roads. Uh, but even here, we we have a certain growth rate on the uh, on the tr uh, road freight sector, but it's not as big as the economic growth is. So we, we, we need to, to touch that in a certain point of view. And, and, and also, if you go in the, uh, um, into the details of the growth forecast, you see the slide. Um, you see how it was um, published in, in 2007. Um, and we had a significant uh, growth rate expected. That was the first left line. And then three years later, um, and of course, then we had the crisis. And you see uh, again that uh, the growth has not been achieved, uh, unfortunately, from a tr from a, a vehicle manufacturer's point of view. Um, and and uh, then another three four years later, you see that uh, even now we are in a situation uh, that we are far far below the expected growth rate. And if you go back to some of the uh, of the official announcement by the Commission, they are still based on on uh, let's say forecasts which are not really uh, justified. So we expect to have, a, unfortunately, from a, from a vehicle uh, manufacturer's perspective, uh, much lower growth uh, than than it is um, anticipated years before. The second thing is there are publications on the table that uh, that we have not achieved, let me say, a certain reduction rate over the, 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 the past. Uh, my company did a very expensive uh, measurement um, because, because these publications rely on a transport magazine in Germany, which is very well known, and, and uh, th this is the only magazine which has really a long history and is measuring since many years. And, and publishing all those data. And if you, if you take everything together, we are in a situation that uh, if you take the scale very small, it looks like that, uh, uh, that, uh, that there is no uh, improvement. Uh, but if you then go into details, then you will see that, for example, they changed over the time the test routes. Uh, they also changed over the time some other things. And uh, that was the origin that we said, no, we need to do a an, an, an real validation. And we need, that means that the magazine has to do it. And that has to be supervised by an official institute, which, which has been DECRA, as you can see it. So and if you go in detail, then we took a vehicle from 1996. We took a second vehicle from around 2003, to, uh, which was already in line with Euro 3. And then, of course, we took a, a 2016 vehicle uh, um, uh, in order to have also the latest technology in that time. And what you see on the left side, and I think that really shows the improvement over the time, um, we had 40.8 uh, 40 40 liters fuel consumption. Um, and if you take then um, the 2003 vehicles, we have been already achieved an improvement of 3.4 liters, which were about 8.3 percent. And then if you take then the, next, the, the, the second one, uh, you see that over, if you take everything together, vehicle one compared to vehicle three, we had an improvement of roughly about 21.8 percent over, over, uh, uh, over those years. So significant improvement. And that is really uh, where we believe we should really be very cautious uh, if, you, if you look in certain, uh, let me say, um, politically influenced studies. Second thing, and I, s I said it already, uh, we are also very active on the US side. Uh, maybe we are the most active one in the US. 
um, and and uh, we know exactly where our vehicles are in the U.S. and where our the, where the vehicles are in the EU. So on the left side, you see publications also by by uh, some NGOs, which um, um, try to let's say put on the table that there will not not be enough improvement on the European side, and that really leads then to the discussion on that the U.S. might be better than the EU. And from our perspective, that's simply not the case. Um, first of all, and I think I don't want to go through all the numbers, you can do that later on by yourself, but if you, if you take everything together, because we are providing more or less the same engine to the US as we do it to Europe, um, it's si similar on the axle side and transmission and so on and so forth. So it's really at the very end not a question of uh, having different technology, so much different technology in the, in the places. Uh, it's more about the vehicle weight and re referring the payload and it's more about speed between the, the uh, various markets. And if you, if you compare that and take that into account, you see that, uh, that we have a difference of roughly about two liters between the EU and the US market. It's not that the U.S. is, is worse than, uh, than, um, than the EU under its and their boundaries. They are similar or identically efficient, but they have different boundaries. Yeah? And, and that needs to be taken into account once when you compare the EU and the U.S. regulation, because it implies, and if you go to the left side, it implies that the U.S. will have a much better and much higher uh, progress than the EU will have, and that is not correct, at least from, from our perspective. It has been already mentioned, uh, now we are going into various activities on the regulatory side, and um, uh, regulators tend to, let's say, uh, to take things into account which the industry usually can't or have already been done. So um, once, when you go in detail, there is, there is a certain difference between the manufacturers, and one manufacturer has put more activity on the ancient side and puts more money into the, uh, into the engine than another manufacturer does while, does while the other manufacturers might do more on the aerodynamic side or more on the tire side or whatever. Um, so comparing, let's say, and, and George has already mentioned, there is an, let's say, an average efficiency of 46%. Um, I would doubt that every engine on, uh, on the European market has a best point efficiency of 46% because simply not everybody takes the same money into the engine. Um, and so if you, if you take that uh, into account, you need really to come to a certain baseline. And that is what I uh, would take up uh, from Rolf's statement. Um, if we would have a reliable declaration already in place in Europe, then we, we would be happy because then we could rely on, on reliable numbers. But as the Commission currently rushes uh, towards a regulation already on the, uh, on the table by mid next year, uh, they don't have this reliable information. Um, and that makes, makes our life quite complicated because now we have to think into uh, what kind of baseline do we really uh, take for, for a regulation. Um, so to, to provide all the numbers between the manufacturer is impossible for antitrust reasons. So we need to communicate between the commission, we need to communicate also with NGOs and so forth, and so on and so forth. So it makes it very complicated and makes it tricky. And the other thing certainly, and one, one example was the ancient, uh, the other thing is certainly if you, if you go into the speed of improvement between the manufacturers, um, that is certainly everybody has his own product cycle. So the one might have a product cycle in 2016, the other one might have it in 2018. So um, that really leads then to a certain, let me say, different, uh, different uh, level in, 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 the, uh, in the market. Um, and the third thing is, of course, that everybody is using different technologies uh, finally in the uh, in, in the market. So my company is just bringing up um, some, let's say, small fleet um, trials. Um, uh, you see on the left side is this uh, uh, battery electric driven uh, counter and on the right side is uh, urban e-truck, how we call it, uh, for heavy duty distribution. But of course those are small scale fleet applications. 
Is that already enough to put that into account into such a regulation? Question mark. Uh, from, from our perspective, not really, because it's, uh, those are demonstrators by far too expensive and uh, very difficult to take into account in such a regulation. Um, and then, of course, um, we usually talk in, in these regulations in, in Europe uh, as, as, as regulations which are dealing tank to wheel. So if you once then think of that, of course, especially in, in, in our business, uh, we have uh, biomass, uh, we have uh, what we call in future also e-fuels, so power to gas fuels, for example, methane, which is based on, on, uh, on a power to gas process uh, and things like that. So how do we take that into account? Uh, so uh, right now there is not enough methodology already in, uh, in place in order to keep that into or to put that into this regulation. But especially for long hauls, we should not take or do the, the mistake that we do the same things like on the passenger car side. Uh, especially in, in the heavy duty business, uh, this is an important aspect. And, and Rolf talked about already on the, on the integrated approach and all these steps are, um, are uh, counting into an integrated approach. Um, is, is a very important thing. One thing uh, is then uh, something what is really important from our side as well, which is the trailer. So we did extend, extensive uh, measurements and tests uh, with, with trailer manufacturers together in order to really show what is possible. And if you take uh, a trailer into account or the efficiency improvement potential of a trailer in the market, this is uh, really significant. So right now we are talking again on, um, on let me say, on tractor or on, on the OEMs. Uh, but once when we settle or when we talk about the reduction targets, we should keep in mind that there is a lot of and there is an important reduction potential also on the trailer side, which is not influenceable by the OEMs. So I think um, this is something what we really keep in mind as well. Uh, and we should take that into, into account into a target setting process. Yeah, we talked already on, uh, on, on, on the vector tool and we talked already also on, the, um, on, on this upcoming uh, activity or this ongoing activity by the European Commission. Um, and now we are going a little bit maybe into details on um, let's say how sh such a regulation should look, li look like and I think uh, there are many many details which will and you will see that in, in near future which will be discussed and which will finally influence also our future business. Um, as, as also Rolf mentioned uh, we might come up and see and this has been already announced by the German government that CO2 becomes a part of the German toll. So how to do that is a really tricky thing um, and uh, we, we are currently investigating that uh, significantly because it's, um, it's in a certain way uh, even more influencing than the, the, the regulation might do. Um, the other thing of course is uh, that the US are very innovative and I would say also very open to what they call averaging banking and trading. Um, in, in Europe, it, we are not, or the regulation or the parliament has not been so far op uh, open to such an activity. Uh, but it, in, in our respect, especially in the heavy duty business, this is a very important topic because um, we are much more relying on cycles, uh, economic cycles, than, uh, than our PESCAR colleagues do. And uh, so we, are, we have fluctuations of 20% from, from one year to the other year and, and sometimes even more and we have to live with that. And within these fluctuations we also see a change of the, of the classes. So if we have a very unflexible uh, regulation in that respect, that might really be a, a high impact, might have a high impact on, on our future business. So, Things like that um, we, we really need to keep in mind once when, when we are talking more and more in next month uh, on this upcoming regulation. 
Um, and it, as I said, finally, it really has an has an tremendous effect on on our industry. Um, summarizing everything, um, the European heavy truck industry, heavy duty truck industry, is the leader in the world, not someone else. Uh, I have to say it again and again, although some people believe that it's not the case. Um, Within the last eight years, we had a tremendous progress, uh, not only on the, on the criteria pollutant side, but also on improving the fuel economy. Um, again, TCO is still the most important thing. And we, of course, we have to say that uh, under the current diesel prices, the, the, the pressure on that side um, has not been as high as it has been under high um, uh, prices, but uh, they're still the driving force at all for, for our industry. Uh, Vector will bring, is, in, is, is the right way to go. Simulating the fuel consumption will, will be a robust and a comparable procedure, and it will improve the fuel economy, as said already before. Um, and uh, coming back to the beginning of my presentation, I think really re Europe should really be active and, and in that respect the European Commission and uh, also the European institution should be active and push other markets to adopt our simulation tool because it's the most comprehensive uh, simulation tool in the world. Um, and by saying that I'm happy to uh, answer your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Manfred. Uh, so we, before we move to the break, we have some time for a question or two. So uh, we have a microphone. Who else has a microphone? Raise your hand if you have a question for Manfred. Uh, I'll start, Manfred. Uh, you, you raised the issue of trailers uh, and the trailer efficiency, efficiency impact. I guess we've seen trailer regulation in the US coming up for phase two. How much does uh, aerodynamics feature in in the current discussion in Europe, in Vecto, is, is aerodynamics of trailers considered? I guess it isn't. Uh, even, even aerodynamics of tractors, is that if, if you improve the aerodynamics of your tractor, is that factored into the performance in Vecto? Well, the system uh, Vecto works in a way that we have uh, defined, uh, together with the trailer industry, a, a standard trailer. And we, we simulate the vehicles on the basis of this uh, standard trailer. Yeah, so in that respect, uh, we have not, uh, let's say, the improvement of a trailer already included. Um, what we now need to have is something that we really push uh, the trailer industry as well towards an improved um, uh, uptake rate of, this measure, uh, of these measures. They have already developed these measures. Um, and and um, so it's up to the customer finally to take all these measures to improve the aerodynamic. Uh, situation in the market, and you, if you if you travel around, you will see gradually some are coming up, yeah. but not not, uh, not enough. Um, but you can imagine um, the uh, let's say the the engineering power uh, of these uh, trailer manufacturers is by far not comparable to the one in the OEM industry. So the, for them, it's really the question that they have a tool available which is, um, let me say, easy to, to apply but robust in the results. And, and s since years we are pushing for that and we are working and, and all together we are, we are trying to develop something, uh, but for years uh, there has not been any public support uh, for this tool development. So we will see whether we will, can, we will have progress on that side, but we need to have something. Thank you. Uh, any more questions for Manfred? Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good to hear the update, and uh, let's hope that the developments are heading in the right direction. Thank you, Manfred. So, right on time, we have a chance to take a break, and uh, we will be... Uh, the refreshments are available in the hall next door. Please go and help yourselves, and... Uh, have a chance to rest and refresh, and it will return at 11.30 for the next session. So you have 35 minutes break. <laughs>